On our way to 1 Peter, could we go by 2 Corinthians? 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Something just struck me. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. On our way to 1 Peter. Basically, the question is, why do believers suffer? And there was something that just struck me. The Apostle Paul, we see as you read the book of Acts and, of course, his testimony, he suffered a lot. Now, I can't, I can't, like Brother Bishop said, no, no, excuse me, it was uh, Jim Benny when he was here, and he had this man with him that was visiting somebody in the hospital that was in a body cast. And this guy who was fit and trim and muscular and stuff looked at this fellow in the body cast and he goes, I know exactly how you feel. Jim grabbed him and pulled him out of the room. Said, what in the world did you just say? Well, I just feel, you're lying. You have absolutely no idea how he feels. Isn't it great to know that God does? God knows. But there was just something, as I was sitting here, it just struck me. Let's go to verse 7, 2 Corinthians 12. Many of us know that this is when the Lord, excuse me, this is when Paul was speaking about his thorn in the flesh. Let's start at verse 7. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. Now stop and think about this. This is Paul. I mean, this is Paul. Absolutely, I mean, throttle stuck to the floor, going 100, 000, you know, going 200 miles an hour for the Lord. I mean, in high gear, he's going, but he's got this thorn. Surely the Lord would take this from him because he's being used of God so much. And he said, no. Verse 9. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Now, it struck me. God never told him why. He just gave him a thorn. Now, Paul said lest I should be exalted above measure. But he never heard from God. You know, why, Lord, why? And, and I got to thinking about it. It's the same thing with Job. Job asked God, why? And God's response was, where were you when I created the universe? Now, having said that, let's go to 1 Peter chapter 1. There are times that we honestly, we hurt for ourselves. We just, you know, I, I remember Heather one time, she got hurt really bad. She was just a little girl. And she had actually fallen and, and punct punctured a hole through her cheek and blood was just coming like crazy. And she said, as she's crying, and we're getting ready to take her to the hospital, she says, I, I, I wish I could wake up, that this was a bad dream. You ever had a situation where you w wished you could wake up and it was a bad dream? Yeah, you know, so many. Why, Lord? It's just, again, it's, it's the same thing with Job. When it comes to why, 
I think we're going to wind up getting a good picture here. It might not be the answer that we want, but it's a good answer. It's a good answer. Those of you that were in the military, you know that when you went in, I mean, you signed, you, you signed your name away. The military is going to use you how they see fit. Our God is a lot more loving than the military. He's a lot more knowing, praise God, than the military. He uses us as he sees fit. We're going to start reading, actually, in verse 3. We're going to read through verse 9. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, ye love, in whom though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Let's just, let's take a moment and let's ask the Lord. We, 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 need his, we need his help to ascertain this, but I believe it's going to be a joy. I hope and pray it is. Let's, let's just, let's pray. Lord, once again, we, we come to you and we ask you that you'd open your word to us. Time and again, as your people gather, this reality must be embraced. That the true giver of wisdom, the true one who is helping us to understand these scriptures is the Holy Spirit. We need your spirit, Lord. We need your spirit in the pulpit. We need him with us all. Lord, I don't know what the future holds as the song goes, but we know who holds the future. So Lord, help us. There are folks here that have gone through tough times, tough times personally, tough times also because of near and dear relatives, tough times because of pain, tough times because of job situations so many reasons. And Lord, we wind up asking why. You told Paul simply this, my grace is sufficient. Lord, we know your grace is sufficient according to your word. Help us to grasp what seems to be an answer to why here. At, at least, Lord, a general understanding of how you can use the trials that we go through. So open your word, I pray. In Christ's name, amen. So once again, you know, we ask why. I think the answer begins with this statement. Number one, a powerful faith. Now we just read verses 3 through 9. I want you to go to verse 6, if you would please. Paul, excuse me, Peter in writing this says, wherein ye greatly rejoice. Wait a minute. What, what, what do you mean by that? In the, in, in the Greek language here, and I'm not going to go in big time Greek, and I've told you before, I'm not a Greek expert, where I, but I know where the brains are. That word wherein does not point to salvation, it points to time. In other words, the rapture. 
wherein ye greatly rejoice. Look at the previous verse, verse 5, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Again, the rapture. Wherein ye greatly rejoice. That's a strong faith, a powerful faith. The word rejoice there speaks of an outward extreme joy made possible because of this very thing, what we know is coming. Folks, we're going to be in heaven someday. I mean, this world is not our home. Boy, time and, and, and again, we've got to remind ourselves of that. And I mean, we can, we can say, well, you know, hey, yeah, sure, I, I mean, I know that is coming. Wait a minute, pull over, back the truck up, do whatever you've got to do, but stop and understand. In 25 years, which how many of you realize now that 25 years is not that long? In 25 years, if the Lord tarried, how many of us are going to be standing before the Lord in heaven? I don't think I'll be here in 25 years. The point is this. We've got to get this fact down, that this knowledge that we have, we greatly rejoice in, at least we ought to. And then he says this, though now for a season. The word season means small, few, just, just a little while compared to eternity. If it be, if need be, now that's hypothetical, okay. If it seems to be, it's not affirmative, you're not gonna positively go through tough times, but hey, if it happens, you're in heaviness. You're in heaviness, difficulty, through what? Through manifold temptations. Now that word temptation, temptations, it refers to the all-encompassing what we can wind up going through. We can wind up going through trials, testings. We can wind up having things, or excuse me, people or the devil himself seek to tempt us. But the fact of the matter is, we're going to go through those. It's not easy. There are some people where the trial comes and goes in maybe a matter of hours, days, weeks, whatever. Some people, they look and they feel like they're trapped. I've got to deal with this for the rest of my life. But the fact of the matter is, be it ours or the rest of our life, God knows. And he says there's a joy because it's only temporary, even if you're looking at the rest of your life here. He will give power. Why? Because he did it with Paul. Paul wasn't told why. He was told how. My grace is sufficient. Therefore, taking Peter and taking Paul and bringing them together, because God's grace is sufficient, praise God, no matter the time span, we can greatly rejoice. Even though the temptations come. They're going to come, if but for anything else, for this. We stand for Christ. Am I right? We've trusted Christ. If you stand for Christ, you guarantee yourself you're going to be against the world, even if it was a good election. Because no man, no man on this earth can guarantee us anything. We've had good people turn on us. Good people. We've had good people fail us. Why? Again, from this morning, Psalm 118. Listen, we've had people that we love misunderstand us and turn on us there's been tough times like that this is you know this this is something that seriously this is the kind of thing we step aside and we say lord i i, I need help it's tough enough what the world brings to us the world so often brings ridicule abuse mockery silence they bypass us no job uh help they hold us down. This is one thing that really irks me. The world seeks to define us. I hate that. They look at us and say, you're haters. No, we are not. We bring the greatest love story. No, you're a hater. No, we're not. 
But that's one of the things that we deal with. They shut us out. They ignore us. It can get to the point where, like you see in people overseas, where they confiscate property and even put someone to death. Why? Because of Christ. Now, we can say, well, you know, we're not going through that. Well, that's only because of the grace of God. It's not because of man. And even with everything maybe a little bit better now, no, there could be a time when we're going to wind up facing some really difficult times. Really difficult times. Every genuine believer who lives for Christ knows the tough times. You be in Christ long enough, and not only will you get to know it, you'll get to know it well. Again, people on the job misunderstand, etc., etc. When we think of people that we've seen on the news, people that have been fleeing something, a flood, a, 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 an oppressive government. That's what these people were going through that Peter wrote to. That's what they were going through. And he said, you can be rejoicing in this because of what's coming. Because of what's coming. Who? Christ is coming. I should have said who. Any thinking person can look around and say, you know what? We do have these challenges. We have physical challenges. Who was it that, that we heard about that, uh, oh, from the booths, somebody who has stage four colon cancer. Boy, that, I tell you what, that C word can be a challenge. And it's not just that. It's not just that. It can be disease. It can be sorrow. It can be criticism. Some of the toughest things to deal with is criticism that's not warranted. You were doing your best by God's grace, but somebody decided to pick it apart and pick you apart. That's hard. That's hard. There's loss that winds up happening. Disappointment. Lord, I worked hard at this. Why didn't it work through? He knows. There's also the temptations that come along. We see people going after greed, they go after sorcery, indulgence. They get into things like drunkenness, gluttony, anger, envy, jealousy, and we wind up paying a price. You ever had to deal with somebody that was, that was really impatient? I had to deal with somebody like that in the parking lot yesterday at Costco. And it's like, wait a minute, it's all right, man. You're going you're gonna, to you're gonna be okay. But as far as he was concerned, he needed to get through that parking lot no matter what it cost anybody else. You take that kind of an attitude and you put the culture of America under a pressure cooker like a food shortage and think of what could happen. That's what these people were going through when it came to trying to survive. But I want us to take note of two things that are said here. First of all, we can rejoice in this. Trials and testings are only for a season. They are temporary. They are for a short time. The fact is this. Our salvation is at hand. There is coming that time. It is guaranteed. We will be taken from, we will be delivered from the sufferings of this earth. So we can stand it. Why? Because the Lord told Paul, my grace is sufficient. And his grace was sufficient all the way to the time that they cut Paul's head off. All the time. Number two, trials and temptations cause a heaviness within us. The word heaviness means to be grieving, to suffer sorrow, to suffer stress, anguish. Listen, we all know what it's like to feel that kind of thing. We all know what it's like when we've got something that's like, Lord, what do I do? Please tell me. Let me ask you seriously. This, this, is, this is not a joke because I've been there. How many of you have ever been in a situation where you felt like you were in a room and just like that ride in Disneyland, 
you looked around and there were no there were no doors and there were no windows you were trapped how many of you ever been there i mean it's like lord what do i do it's amazing how god is in the construction business he can come and all of a sudden put a door in a room where there was no door before he can do that but again this is what this verse is alluding to the fact that they're seasonal yes but they cause heaviness I praise God for 1 Corinthians 10, 13. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. We don't go through something unique. I remember dealing with somebody, not in the church, but dealing with somebody that they thought their trials were so unique that even the Lord did not understand what they were going through. That they were going through something that was so bad that Christ, when he was here on earth, did not go through anything like that. They were serious. I'm glad the Lord knows what we go through. And in fact, other people have gone through it, and praise God, in 6,000 plus years of human history, he's already dealt with people that go through the same stuff that we're going through. And he helped them. He helped them. But God is faithful. I love that. God is faithful. I've been thinking about our theme for next year. And I almost, I don't think it's going to be this, but I was thinking about having a banner, beautiful banner, and having two words, God is, dot, dot, dot. And just, you know, if somebody came into the, into the, uh, uh, into the auditorium, whatever challenge that they were going through, they could look at that and go, God, you know, God is good. God is faithful. God is loving. God is kind. Hey, God is powerful. That'd be great. I don't know, maybe I'm talking myself into it. I don't think we're going to. Go, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I remember doing a study on this. And it was fun. Second Corinthians chapter 4, look at verse 8. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. So I thought, I've got to look up those Greek words. You see the word troubled? It means affliction, sufferings due to the pressure of circumstances or antagonism of persons, yet not distressed the distress arising from that condition. So what he's saying is, is look, we have affliction, but we don't have the distress coming from the affliction. God is helping. We are perplexed. The word perplexed means to be without a way, but not in despair. That means utterly without a way. So in other words, he's saying, you know what, we're in this situation and, and, and it feels like we don't have a way, but the fact of the matter is, we are not utterly without a way. When there's God, there is a way. I love that. I, I mean, I was having a great time here. Persecuted, literally pursued, but not forsaken, not abandoned, cast down, literally smitten down but not destroyed, not brought to extinction or ruin. See, it can happen. We can be pressed, but he can't take us completely. We belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. That was free. I, I just, I had to throw that in. That was good. A powerful faith, but also a priceless testimony. I want to show you this. This is great. Look at verse 7. Let's go back to 1 Peter 1. 1 Peter 1. I like this because it has to do with gold. Now, wait a minute. Not the thing that you're thinking about. Because that was just our family. Everybody else, they went fishing. We went gold panning. Just gold is fascinating. Not be, I'll never be rich by it. I'll guarantee you that. But it was just fun. Anybody else here, you, you like going gold panning? 
Okay, hey, great. Okay, excellent. Look at verse 7. That the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found under praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. If you don't get anything else tonight, I want you to get this verse. Because if you're going through challenges, this will give you understanding. The word trial there means to put someone or something to the test. Determining whether it is worthy to be approved or not. The test being made with the, atten- the intention of approving, if possible. It's the approval of our faith. It's the approval of our faith, which is to the praise of the Lord Jesus. But now wait a minute. There's an explanation. We demonstrate we have, we have a genuine God-given, Holy Spirit-produced faith the genuine article. This faith and its working in our lives is to the glory of God, okay? It's not the testing of our faith that is to the glory of God, but the fact that our faith has met the test. Catch this, please. Lord, why am I going through this? I'm not telling you now, but I want you to know my grace is sufficient. And so you go the next day and then the next day, and then the next day, and then the next day. Watch this, please. Picture this. A gold mining company wishes to buy a proposed site. Follow me? A gold mining company company comes along and they wish to produce, to buy a proposed site where gold is said to have been found. But it's not sure whether the metal is real or not, and whether there is sufficient quantity so that a mine, if sunk, would be a profitable venture. It engages an assayer of metals, an assayer of metals, to take samples of the gold ore to his laboratory and examine them. Are you with me so far? The assayer sends his report. Now he's been given, they have given him some ore that they dug up. They've they've given him some ore. So he takes that, the assayer takes that, and he works with it. He sends a report to the effect that it is true gold and that the gold is is found in sufficient quantity so that the venture will pay. Are, are, are we together? I know it's hard for you to tell me whether or not you really are, but I, l- l- let's keep going a little bit more on this. The report, the report of the assayer approving the gold ore is of far more value to the mining company than the gold he returned with his report because it's on the basis of the report that the company makes their decision to sink a mine and go on in. They don't send the ore back and the company goes, oh, I'm so glad we got this back. <laughs> this is really something. No, they go to the, they go to the report. Wow, <coughs> there's gold in them there hills. Now they've got that little bit, but there's so much more. God finds our faith to be one which he can approve. He has put it to the test. And he finds it that it is far more value to him, to his glory, than the approved faith for he has something to work with, a faith that he knows can stand the testings and the trials which may come to the Christian. He sees it in you and in me Day one, you're trusting him. It's tough, it's hard, but you're trusting him. Day two, ditto. Day three, he says, there's faith in that heart. 
Now, how did this all come about? Like the man who determines how to see the purity of the gold, he put us in the fiery trial. You know the story. It's like the man who takes the ore and puts it in the crucible in the fire, cranks up the fire, and he knows it's pure when he can see after scooping off the impurities, he can see his face. God put the test to the ore of faith. He sees you trusting him. It's difficult, it's hard, you'd under, you don't understand, but you're trusting him, and he says, that's it. That's it. And he will grow you, he will stretch you and me, and he will show us that indeed we can glorify him when we let him just keep mining us and filling us and strengthening us for his glory. He does this for a purpose. Now let me stop right here. I don't like to suffer. I don't. Anybody here you really enjoy? I don't, I don't, I don't like it. But I do know this, in the year 2016, soon to be 2017, for whatever reason, God might call something on us, upon us, for his glory. I don't know why, except this, what we read here. Look again at verse 7. That the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of that gold that we just talked about, that gold that perisheth, though it may be tried with fire, might be found under praise and honor and glory when at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Christ's likeness is the goal of our Lord in us. It's Christ in you. Like we talked about this morning, Colossians 1, the hope of glory. The fiery trial causes us to do something. And you know this, we've been here, if, if you've gone through something, what is it that you wind up doing? There are those that will say, if this is what God's love is, forget it, I'm walking away. But the fact of the matter is, they probably, many of them, never knew the Lord in the first place. Most of the time, what happens? If the Lord puts us in a trial, we wind up on our knees, don't we? We're coming to him. Hey, we're just like the psalmist in Psalm 119, 67. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now have I kept thy word. It's brought me closer to you, Lord. The greater the trial, the more we realize we need God and we come to him. Let us not forget that. When our faith is tried and proven, when we walk strong through the trials, not only does God see it, but the world sees it. 1 Corinthians 3, every man's work shall be made manifest, open, for the day shall declare it, but because, <coughs> excuse me, it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. There's coming a time when, he, when the Lord's going to say, see, and he's going to reward us. And even on this earth, people will see it. They'll see it. So there's a powerful faith that we have. The power is in him. There's a priceless testimony. It's better than gold. And then lastly, we see the precious Savior of it all. Look at verse 8. Whom having not seen, ye love, in whom, though now ye see him not, Yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Let me explain. There were those that knew Christ when he was here on earth. They knew him. They walked with him. The apostles did. But now the Lord has gone. He's in heaven now. These people never met him. They never saw him. They never saw his miracles. 
They never saw his suffering. They never saw him on the cross. They never saw him after he resurrected. What do they see? They see those that have come and have given testimony and they have trusted him and the Holy Spirit has painted a picture of that Savior. Not the earthly Savior, but the heavenly reigning King. That is what he's talking about here. We do not live by the picture of Christ painted by some artist. We don't. But at the same time, at the same time, art is only appreciated by an artist. When it comes to our walk in Christ, the way we appreciate him is how the Holy Spirit has, as it were, painted him in our hearts. We don't know what color his eyes are, but we know that he loves us. We don't know what color hair it is, except you look at the Revelation, and I mean, there's, there's, there's a definite picture of him in the Revelation. But we do know this. He has been painted to us by the Holy Spirit through the guidance of the Word of God as loving, caring. He walks alongside us through the Holy Spirit. He meets our needs. You see, that is what has been painted to us. That's what was painted to these people. As someone said, to know him is to love him. To know him more is to love him more. And that's what Peter wanted with these. He was going to show them Christ. And that through their suffering, they would get to know him more. And while they're coming forth as gold, he is looking priceless. And that is what God is going to do for us in the days ahead. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's stand for prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we don't know in the days ahead, even right now, the what, whys, and wherefores of, tri of our trials except this. You desire us to be purified. You desire a greater understanding that brings us to a greater love. Lord, I pray that you'd give us strength. I pray that you'd give us understanding of you, even this week, as we give thanks for all that you've done for us. Help us to see you. Bless, we ask. Thank you for the understanding that the Scripture brings us. I pray in Christ's name. Amen.